Here is part two of our discussion on Detective Stories with Dr. Chris Chan. Uh, for now, for those of you who didn't catch part one, you may want to go there. Uh, there's a number of clues and hints uh, which will help make more sense of the discussion which follows on on this mysterious genre. Yes, this is what happens with such a big topic with so many points. I keep going around in the spot or back and forth in a spiral. But I think what I was saying, too, is how a lot of these um, authors of the Detection Club we thought that their genre had an expiration date. And mm-hmm. not just because there were other critics who thought it was a passing fad that, that did, had no real permanence, but because the idea that the mystery genre, the idea that the idea that there is a, um, you know, a whodunit, where the reader can play along and figure out who did as well and be surprised at the end by a twist. And the idea that it would would eventually be supplanted by the crime story that where it's not necessarily about the crime but about the solving the crime but the actual crime I, and, and that's where you'd um, you figure the a difference where it could be anything from you see the heist or the caper story or the idea of you know the uh, there could be like the unsolved mystery where no one not even the reader finds out who did it and it's all on the psychology of the people who are affected by the crime. So mm-hmm. the idea of the traditional mystery and crime, where you know you can see this in a whole lot of police procedurals today. You can read a 500-page book and be never know who did figure out who did it, until because you don't have any uh, the killer hasn't been introduced. And then on page four ninety five, the detectives just uh, by doing standard police work or by pure luck stumble across the killer, and that's just how it, it works because you can't solve it. But that's you know it's, it is sometimes that's how it is in real life, sometimes not. But that's the idea of the idea of being the idea we talk about. You know, there's so many ways to cover a crime because you know. How does this happen? You know, is it about the solving of it or is it about the aftermath? And there's, I mean, everything, I think the movie Blow Up is all about an, you know, crime where you did an unsolved crime. And it, that, and no, when you don't get answers, a lot of people feel cheated. I think that, um, I think that, you know, there really is, when you think about it, you have all these critical theorists talking about how, more and more books need to re- reflect real life. The idea of so you know, so many crimes today in so many cities. I think that I think on the show Dexter, they made a point of saying that in real life, tw- um, only twenty five percent of homicides in Miami, Florida, are closed, and other major cities in America have a- astoundingly high um, uh, rates of of unsolved murders. And when you think about, so you have all these people, you know, dealing with what happens with it. And you have some people saying, well, it really doesn't matter. You have people, again, you have, uh, again, Crimes and Misdemeanors, a Woody Allen movie, which, uh, uh, re- spoilers, is all about a man who gets away with murder and realizes, you know, it doesn't matter. You can kill somebody and go on with your business the rest of your days without uh, uh, letting your silly conscience bother you. And you have other people, you know, just uh, in Milwaukee, there are a number of prominent cases, murders, disappearances, never solved. And it's become almost an annual, a sad tradition. Almost every year, you've got the interviews with the surviving family members who want to know what happened to their daughter, what happened to their husband. And there's rarely any answers. So I think that the idea that the the mystery versus crime or who done it who done it so the, the, there's a big difference and i'm not saying one's better than the other but i do think that when you think about what the audience wants there is a big people want answers they may not necessarily care about on screen in the book what happens to all the other characters after the truth is revealed but they want to know. And I think about uh, uh, over a decade ago, there was, um, if, if, you know, if you know about Scandinoir, there was this very popular series, I don't know, called um, 
Ford Bradelson, or I don't, I, I, but it, someone who probably knows um, Nor these Nordic languages can correct me, but it's The Killing translated. It was, ran for three oh, seasons. Yeah. yeah. And it was, yeah, it's a, and the first season is all about this um, one um, police detective who, a, a woman who investigates the killing of a teenage girl. And so, as is often the case, a popular show was brought to the um, U.S. and it became The Killing. It was, I think, I believe it was set in the American Northwest. And it, was, it, it became a sensation in its first season. It was, you know, it started airing episodes, again, covering the, uh, the case of the girl's murder over the course of, the, you know, episode to episode. But it, and everyone was expecting the murder to be wrapped up neatly at the end of season one. And then, you know, they make an arrest and the mild spoilers and then realize, oh, wait, this person didn't do it in the last minute. And I think it caused just this huge backlash. And, you know, the show never recovered at ratings or critics wise. It ran for a couple more seasons, got canceled, brought back, then came back for a, a bridged final fourth season. But I thought, you know, this could all have been avoided if they basically said, you know, this is going to be a two season story. Yeah. And so everybody so you know, all they had to say is come right out and say, look, everybody, this is just such a big story that we're going to take two seasons to tell. So we're not going to let you down. We're just going to say to be continued. All right. Yeah, you'll have to wait a while, but we'll hope you'll have fun trying to rewatch the episodes and yeah. solve, you know, solve the puzzle yourself. People would have taken that that or this you know, in a different way. But when this, you know, it's like a, a line from the uh, Fred Carmichael was a playwright who wrote a number of mystery comedies and one done to death. He teases the audience, making them think he's not going to show who did it. He does. But he says that this is so terrible. It's like go the dying characters think this, it's like we're not going to figure out who killed us. It's like the it turned to the last page of a mystery novel and it's saying, guess who? So I think, you know, there's a, essentially an unspoken contract with the reader or the viewer. The idea that we will provide you with a mystery and you get to get, uh, try to guess who did it. But at the end, you will find out what really happened. Mm -hmm. And if the author or the production team is in breach of contract, well, the audience riots. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, or the, and okay, this is another problem that I've had with, certain um, TV episodes or books because a lot of times they wrap it up but they never tie together all the clues mm -hmm. or something like that that they they point in a different way or they leave you know so this thing that you know it means that it might not have worked out that way after all because the you know how could the killer have done this and they explain this and when you there's reasonable doubt in the mind of the reader or the viewer so I think that that's something that a lot of writers don't real uh, aren't very good. It's the idea of tidying up after themselves because a lot of people claim they get upset seeing all these little loose threads tied up. But the fact is, you know, if you don't um, resolve every clue you have, you leave lingering doubt that the author had no idea who the killer really was, or that you can't. The mm -hmm. idea that. It's not, it's a, it's a, you can't read a mystery and say, oh yeah, the butler did. Wait, but how do we know? He didn't confess. What evidence was there? It doesn't matter. The detective said it was him. So that's all you have to know. And so it's like, because when you think about it, it's not enough. You can just say, just to say, to, oh, it's a game of clue. You open up the envelope and it was ever pictures on the card. That's who did it. No, you actually have to have an explanation. And the idea, you know, Ag the, the Christie you know, made the whole big summation in the drawing room uh, mm -hmm. scene. And that's the idea. You, know, you actually need to take this time to explain this whole complex puzzle and to sort through every little thing that was brought up and to explain it. And that's, I think, one of the reasons Christie is popular, because she plays fair. Because you know, when you read a Christie book, she's going to play absolutely fair with you, unlike some authors who are just going to, you know, throw a random killer in the last 10 pages and never justify it.
Yeah, her her and John Dixon Carr were the best at that. Uh, so let me let me. You, you said you don't want to say the mystery novel is better than the crime story. I'm going to argue kind of that it is. Um, although I I'm also going to build in something there that might count against that. So Ayn Rand, who we've talked about before, and who yeah. I don't have much love for, but she in her book The Romantic Manifesto, she makes an interesting case that like the point of fiction and art is not to show reality. It's meant to convey a metaphysical worldview, right? So in real life, yes, there seem to be things that are random and purposeless and sad, but she thinks, she argues that it's immoral to make a book like that, where things are just aimless and sad and nihilistic, because the okay. point of art is actually to ennoble and embolden. Again, as an atheist, I don't think she can actually sustain this, but you know, that's, that's her whole sure. moral yeah. uh, um, assertiveness, I guess. Yeah. Now, the you, know, you talk about like the audience wants a resolution. I'm going to ask why. And I'm going to say it's because the human heart needs a resolution to the mystery that is the world, right? Um, that, that we we need an answer. Like we're longing for like what is really going on here. I mean, I know for myself, I think I've talked to you about this, but I was, you know, I'm on, I'm on the autism spectrum like Dr. Chan is. I was raised in a charismatic uh, Pentecostal home, very emotional faith. My real conversion to Christianity happened and, and to theology was when I started reading apologetics for the resurrection of Jesus, because it felt like a whodunit. Like the argument oh. that Jesus must have risen from the dead felt like an attack right. story. Okay. Except, except instead of who killed this guy, it was yeah. how could this guy not be in his grave anymore? Right. And, and, and yeah. it felt like, that's how apologetics felt like, like the case of the empty tomb, you know? Uh, and that yeah. unlocked the mystery of the whole universe. Um, and I just pulled up, because I, I, it's such a good line, I have to use it. The last line of the Father Brown story, it's the very last Father Brown story that was published. The, the, the story is called The Insoluble Mystery, oh. uh, which Father Brown solves. Um, oh, okay. The last line is him, he goes to adoration, and he says uh, he raised, so this is Chesterton. Father Brown raised his eyes and saw through the veil of incense smoke and twinkling lights that benediction was drawing to the end while procession waited. The sense of accumulated riches of time and tradition pressed past him like a crowd moving in rank on rank through unending centuries and high above them all like a garland of unfading flames, like the sun of our mortal midnight, the great monstrance blazed against the darkness of the vaulted shadows as it blazed against the black enigma of the universe. For some are convinced that this enigma is also an insoluble problem and others have equal certitude that it has but one solution. Bam! It's the last last line of the other case, and that I think that's implying yes, like just yeah. like these who don't have been reading have a solution. The universe has a solution now in quote unquote real life, by which we mean in history, like in our temporal existence. They don't all seem to. The Jack the Ripper is not caught, right? These poor girls in Milwaukee and in Edmonton and Alberta and Canada, right? These missing and murdered Indigenous women. It goes unsolved in this life, but we as human beings have not just a natural need, a supernatural need for an answer, all right? And we are, and the, the, the Christian promise is we're going to get one. Right. right? And, and that is represented in kind of a little mythic form in these little stories that in, in the universe of the story, you want that resolution because in the universe of the world, we want a resolution to it. Now, even if we know that in real life, the killers won't always be caught, this story needs to remind me that ultimately there will be justice in the world. Like, I need to have that feeling when I'm done reading, you know? Mm, okay. um, so I don't, think, I don't think this is just us being, you know, wanting, I want to solve the puzzle because I'm just greedy or something like that. I think it's, it just speaks to the deep impulse of the human heart that possibly God put there. So these are like sacramentals then, uh, the, the, the stories, right? They're touchstones which point Ooh. towards the... Um, I mean, it's putting it strongly, but I, I tend to think so. Well, and this is, so this is where, you know, you a lot of people would see a difference between fantasy and mystery. Um, okay. All right. Uh, and actually, I know J.R.R. Tolkien apparently did not much care for Dorothy Sayers' detective stories. Uh, but yeah. C.S. Lewis did. Um, like C.S. Lewis, there's a few examples. It's in um, uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, okay. right? When they find, they go to the, I think it's, which, is it the Golden Island? He sees a, a skeleton wearing an armor and every, and, um, Lewis makes the point that it was Edmund had read a lot of detective stories. So yeah. he deduced, like he was able to infer what was okay. happened yeah, in the sure. back of the water. Okay. Uh, it's also in, um, I think it's in the Space Trilogy, that when someone converts to Christianity, it says all of the, he, he started reading the fantasy stories he read as a kid again. He loved them again. And he didn't like any of his adult books anymore, except Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and Lewis yeah. makes the point of saying that. He, he, yeah. he likes fantasy stories and Sherlock Holmes <laughs> 
So, and I think there is a convergence there and that, first of all, good fantasy is actually about, well, what they're both about is the rationality of the universe. Right. Right. The detective story only works if the universe is fundamentally rational. Like nihilistic modern literature doesn't, right? Yeah. It's postmodern. It's all about how the universe is aimless and we've made everything up anyways and imposed it. And to some extent, crime stories are that way, right? Um, this is like Raymond Chandler and his, uh, what is it? The, um, oh, what's that? Essay? Oh, uh, the, the Art simple Art of murder. Simple Art of Murder, yeah, that's right, where he criticizes the kind of uh, parlor room murder and he writes the hard-boiled detective stories, right? You know, the, the gumshoes, like, uh, in, in his bleak, you know, on the streets, right? Uh, mixing with the gangsters, right? That's because it's more realistic, right? Um, but really, the, the the idea there is of the, of the drawing or mystery is the world is really rational. Um, and I think that's also the case right. with Tolkien and Lewis. Like, the fantasy story shows that there's a plan behind all of this. Um, yeah. And a, a hope behind all of it too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I mean, in a certain sense, Sherlock Holmes is a kind of there's almost a Gandalf for a Merlin quality, right? Him, right. right? That yeah. he knows how to navigate this world, right? And he seems like he's magical almost. So I, I think that might have been yeah. why Lewis continued to have harbor an appreciation uh, for fantasies. And for, for Chesterton has both, right? Chesterton is yeah. writing with Elfland, and he's writing detective stories. Uh, and those do converge in a couple of the Father Brown stories as well, but. Uh, I don't know. I, those, so yeah. I, now let me let me add this as well as a counterpoint to all of that. Um, oh, and I'll say this too. Yeah, yeah. And I like that you mentioned crimes and misdemeanors because that's Woody Allen explicitly responding to crime and punishment, right? Because crime and punishment is all about how you couldn't commit a murder without you know, your conscience bothering you. Basically. Oh right, yeah. And crimes and misdemeanor is at least apparently, and I think you can read what happens in the movies in different ways, but at least on the face of it, it's about a guy who murders his lover. It's like a respectable doctor, I think, and he gets away with it, and that's yeah. it. And and there's even a scene at the end where he says, "No, my conscience. I mean, occasionally my conscience bothers me, but I'm fine. You know, yeah. I don't. We don't live in the kingdom of heaven." And, and that's the end of the movie. It's a very bleak yeah. movie right, right. on the face of it. Yeah. Um, so for sure, there's that. Now, a couple of things I think you could say as a critique now of the mystery story from a Christian perspective, and you talk about the killing, right? That's also what happened with the show Twin Peaks. Right, Twin Peaks is about the murder of Laura Palmer in this you know town in the uh, not far from here, all told, in the American Northwest. Okay, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And the point of the show, like it went on and on and on of the investigation of her murder until finally the audience just demanded that they find out who who the killer was. Yeah. And David Lynch, the creator, said he intended to never actually share that, um, except maybe in the final episode. And he said the reason for that was well, he didn't really say the reason, but you can kind of construct that. One of the things Twin Peaks was doing was critiquing something like Murder, She Wrote, where basically the death of a human being is just a puzzle to be solved. Right? And, and it almost kind of seems reductionistic of human life, right? That if, okay. Um, like famously, in the first episode of Twin Peaks, you see a police officer just like weeping over the body of Laura Palmer. Like he's just gutted by it. And that's really what yeah. the show was kind of about, how this whole community was affected mm -hmm. by her death, right? Um, something like, uh, well, yeah, you know, I, Whereas in a lot of detective stories, arguably, um, you know, you're not studying. Uh, I mean, I said this to you before. Detective stories are really strong on plot. I, I know um, uh, the guy who created Columbo said that when he teaches screenwriting, he says, even if you don't like detective stories, study them because it will teach you how to plot your story. Uh, tie right. all the loose ends, like Dr. Chan was yeah. saying. But the character aspect of that can sometimes be lost, where you're not really reading about someone's death because of what it says about the human condition you're trying to find clues of what motive somebody might have right. right, for planting the poison yeah. or whatever. And is there something about that that, um, I guess, misses okay. humanity, All or, right? right? Or, or and, is, and is there something about, um, and I'll say the other kind of maybe Christian critique of it is, is it too, is, is it law without gospel? Um, I remember I was at a, oh, I, I heard law and order described that way. I mean, think of the title, law and order. It's like, it's all about the satisfaction of retribution, like hang him high, McCoy caught the guy. <laughs> and, yeah. and he's going to be punished now, um, as opposed to there's not really an aspect of uh, restoration or grace or forgiveness or, um, and even the scapegoating thing, you know, we found the killer, we can now get him out of the community, now the community has been restored. Well, what about like, me, I'm the murderer, right? I killed Jesus right. Christ, I'm the yeah. sinner. So I can sort of see those two aspects of a, of a Christian critique of the detective story. And it is interesting that Dorothy Sayers, you know, pioneered classical education and wrote some really, really good ones where Peter Whimsey, but she got to a point where she kind of stopped writing, kind of kind of laid them aside. Um, because she sort of thought there were limitations on the genre. 
So I don't know if either of you have thoughts on that or comments on that. Um, it's something I've sort of, again, Dr. Chan and I have both written detective stories. So it's actually something I've sort of wrestled with as I've tried writing these and, and tried, tried to give them some layer and some texture and some, I guess, symbolism and theological weight is, you know, am I just kind of, as, I, as I'm plotting, I'm like, well, am I really just setting up bowling pins here? <laughs> are these just chess right. pieces? Or, yeah. But I don't know, Dr. Chan or, or Dr. McClarney, what, what are your, your thoughts on that kind of being? Well, I think, you know, let's go off on this most recent point. You tell you how when Dorothy L. Sayers stopped writing, there's a famous quote about how she thought that really that um the um it wasn't good for people to keep getting these detective stories with all these nice, neat answers because it's pretty soon they start expecting them all in real life. And mm -hmm. then when they wouldn't get them, you know, it would have a bad effect on them in many ways. And I think that's an, it, that's what, it, it's the same thing, though, too, is, makes you wonder, well, what about the opposite? Because, you know, if you think that having answers to all your mysteries isn't good for you, what about not getting answers? And I think yeah. the idea is with so many of these stories where, you know, not knowing what happened, I think I, in some ways, Agatha Christie started critiquing that more and more over the course of the second half of her career. When you have this case, um, one of her best books, Five Little Pigs, it's all about a murder that was supposedly solved 16 years ago. And then the uh, the woman was convicted of killing her husband. And 16 years later, their grown now grown daughter says that my mother was innocent and I can't move on with my life. I'm engaged and I want to have my own family, but I just can't move forward until I know what really happened. And I think that goes to show, uh, and, and more and more, the same thing when, her, her last published book, Sleeping Murder, the same thing. A young woman finds out that there was a murder actually in her family when she was just a tiny girl. And she thinks, she at the beginning of the book, the woman thinks she's starting up on a new chapter in life. She's recently married. She's moved to a new place. Everything's off to a fresh start. And now she doesn't have that. It, 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 she, she has no peace of mind, no comfort, and she, all she can think about is what happened. And she never does find peace until she finds out what happened. Mm -hmm. um, just one second, please. Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, that raises an interesting question. Uh, just thinking there, talking about knowledge and and of uh, and healing. Uh, you think of you know Francis Bacon's uh, dictum or axiom, you know, knowledge is power. But here, you know, it, it seems like knowledge is actually brings about a uh, a restoration in some ways. So I guess there there's a few a few ways you can look at that. Knowledge is giving you an insight into the past, like say sixteen years earlier, what had happened in the past. So you're able to map what has already happened, but then also knowledge. Uh, she doesn't want to start a family or uh, uh, whatever until she has this knowledge. So then it also lays a ground for the future. So without knowledge of the past, laying to the future, uh, that gap has this, um, brings about a certain anxiety um, and and disquietude that you, you don't feel complete or at least uh, maybe even uh, to the point of inaction, right, uh, where you you can't you can't uh, function properly, or or reach your telos, as you know Aristotle might say, right? You you can't reach completion uh, without this uh, in in uh, components. So, yeah, for sure. Um, now, what, now, what do you think, Dr. Chan or Dr. McClarney, about kind of the, the Twin Peaks style critique of you know people demanding an answer? It's like a, um, I guess trivializing people's deaths or whatever. Well, I think, you know, and I love Twin Peaks, too, but you think you look at um, Twin Peaks and the problem, you know, the network made um, David Lynch uh, provide the answer to who killed Laura Palmer. And after he did, you know, a third of the way through the second season, ratings just nosedived. Yeah. And I think because when I think you know, when you, I watched Twin Peaks, yeah, I wanted to know who did, but you also want to spend time with all the quirky characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, there's, because I think that was the issue. How do you find a balance? Because, I mean, if you ha you brought Dale Cooper in, and then, but if he's in Twin Peaks, you know, what's his purpose? Because, you know, after they solve the case, you know, what's he really doing hanging around there all this time? And I mm -hmm. think that, 
the idea that yeah it's more about the um the uh, again because i think there is the whole th the uh, too you mentioned you see someone crying over laura palmer's body and you, mm -hmm. you, this really is you know a lot of shock and horror like how could someone do this or how could she be in for the wrapped in plastic the yeah. idea uh, the, 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 this is just beyond the pale that someone could do this to her but i think that you know it, it, i think the show was in equal parts who what's these quirky characters but i think you know there was more to the mystery than that like who is bob who was this evil force and explain because i think there really was a whole lot of explanation of evil what people do and what's what makes people weird or cra i mean because necessarily being weird isn't wrong but sometimes the most seemingly normal people have all these very dark secrets and i think that you know it was experimental at the time and i think it's just a matter of knowing your audience because if it like today when um a few years ago he did the revival of Twin Peaks, which doesn't have the same level of direction, and it allows him to go into his own so like these surreal explorations of human condition, family, and whatnot. It was a very different show in some ways, but it makes you wonder, you know, what people want. It's kind of like when you've got the viewers. I mean, they every all these mystery shows are different. You're going to have, as we said. Twin Peaks and Murder, she wrote, are very different shows. And like me, you can really enjoy them both. Mm -hmm. But it depends on what you want. I mean, it doesn't, it's like you know, fans know what they expect because everybody knows you, you turn to an episode of Murder, she wrote, and aside from a couple of two part episodes, you know who's go who did it at the end of the hour. There's no questions. And with the exception of one episode where you had to see, uh, where the killer from the pilot episode is actually brought back like five seasons later, you don't have to see a single episode before that to know what's going on. So and it, some of this is essentially good, solid economics. I think when we talk about why people do this, it's essentially, you know, the creators, you know, they felt the, um, what, the, these TV show writers, they wanted a, ser a show where you didn't have to see anything before. You can start watching at any point. It doesn't matter if you see three episodes or 200. You can just watch it, move on. As long as you know, main character is Angela Lansbury. Jessica Fletcher writes mystery novels, travels the world, solves them. But mm -hmm. when you have something like uh, what I call essentially a long serialized work like Tri Twin Peaks, you have to focus. And so like, like wait a minute, who is this person and, you know, why are is he, why is this man dancing? Why is this woman carrying a log around? And, mm -hmm. the, again, and part of the fun of that is that you have all these theories on what makes the log lady the log lady. But when you, I think it's a case where, you know, it's a show that's different today as opposed to when you had to wait one week between episodes and today, you get them all released in one go on your streaming service, and you can watch them at your pace, knowing that if you want to, you can stay up till four thirty a.m. and figure out, find out who did it. Okay. So, yeah. so, so I think there's the. It reminds me of what the, you said once about X Files when you were, which is a very Twin Peaks inspired show, X Files. But yeah. when you were a teenager, you you had time after each episode to kind of soak it in and like think about it. Yeah, and that's and actually that that's a whole other conversation. But X Files is a pretty good example of how you can use the detective genre to evoke the mystery of kind of reality. You know what I mean? And uh, right. I want to believe, and that's the, right. the, the the truth of what happened to this weird sludge on the floor actually yes. has something to do with the truth of the meaning of life in some ways. I, I, X Files is an interesting case study of that. Um, and, and I'll just say too, I think um, I, you mentioned off screen you were writing a book on Columbo. That's another from the creator of Murder She Wrote or creators. Uh, yep, but Levinson Link. That's right. Yes, exactly. And who said that um, Columbo was based on Father Brown and a Petrovich from Crime and Punishment. Okay. But that's, that is an, an interesting example of how by reverse, by kind of flipping the format, uh, it's a it's a, it's a mystery still, except that you know who the killer is, but that allowed that kind of depth of um, exploration of a character. And in some right. cases, the redemption. Um, yeah. Like the Johnny Cash one. 
which I've, <laughs> where there's an, a kind of an explicit redemption at the end with the Johnny Cash character who's a murderer. So there's, there's flexibility. And I think any literary genre is going to have limitations and advantages, right? Yeah. Uh, and the, the traditional whodunit has the advantage of that kind of the mythological connotations of the eschaton, but it's also limited in that the eschaton isn't in this world. Right. So, yes. so you have to keep that in mind too. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where you, it, it's valuable to have, I guess, Murder, She Wrote and uh, Twin Peaks intention right. commenting on each okay. other. And yeah, yeah, we need that ultimate answer, but we also shouldn't look for them in this world too much, like the Dorothy Sayers uh, critique, I guess you could say. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I'm just thinking with the, the Twin Peaks uh, dilemma there with, um, you know, the producers pressuring to figure out what's what's going on to let the audience know and then the ratings just diving. It's always that makes me think of, uh, I mean, today, what one thing that is keeping cable alive is sports because we don't know mm. the result of the score uh, yet. Oh, interesting. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so anyone uh, who okay. actually does know you know, say it's the Super Bowl or or right now the NBA, NBA or NHL playoffs. Like if if you know the answer, you're not going to bother. Most people are not going to bother watching. It's true. All, yeah, you know, honestly, the, yeah, the it's entire true. thing. So you're left on edge as to what's going, and it's very formulaic. I mean, you start with you know the puck dropping or national anthem, right, and and so on, and you know there's always someone who's to win or lose. Well, at least in the playoffs, there's overtime. Right? Well, there's an Aristotelian structure to it. There's three periods. So, right. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard, Chris, but our local the hockey team has got to the playoffs for the first time since 2006 and the finals are coming up. So it's, a, it is, a, yeah, we're, all, yeah. we're all in the luck of them. Uh, hoping to find out who killed Laura Palmer, who went <laughs> in between Florida and, and even my wife and I, who we really aren't naturally sports fans, but we're watching the games now for that reason. So yeah, I think you're yeah. honest. I mean, that's an intriguing comparison. Yeah. Who's going to. Yes. Yeah, that's the audiences. If we don't have that suspension or left in that suspense, right. Um, the ratings are going to plummet, right? In that sense, uh, if we know what happened already, uh, right? So I think there's something about that being, um, uh, well, I mean, I think stories in general, we can view them as watching life on fast forward. I mean, you're watching life mm -hmm. transpire in other characters' lives, but it then has a reflection back on ours, or we can uh, have that experience, right? So uh, I guess that, that's one thing that allures us uh, in, in, into stories in general. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, but the whole, uh, not to say the formulaic, but uh, the, the whole uh, draw, right? Oh, uh, it is formulaic. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's. Well, what would you call it? You'd say it's liturgical, right. <laughs> um, it's sure. right. like a sports sure. game. Yes, right? yeah, a, yeah. Which is, yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's interesting. Oh, there's so much there. And is that is that a comparison to our own, we live in time, we, we sort of know the ending, but we still uh, live in time. Right. We live in yes. history, but yeah. We, yeah, there's like, a timelessness as well as time. In like the human Boethius is kind of train there or, or caravan, yes, right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all yeah. on the wheel of fortune, but we want to get close to the hub. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, the last thing I just want to comment. This isn't even a question. I just think it's interesting, so I'm just going to throw it out there, and either of you can comment on it. Is um, I, I guess the synchronicity. So, you know, Dorothy Sayers, G.K. Chesterton, open Christians. I get the Christie. Uh, also a very devout Christian in her private life. Like I said, she wrote Christmas devotionals, but also um, her husband, and help me on this, it was Max Malouin. Is that it, Chris? Yes, her a second husband, Max Malouin. Yes, after her own un real life unsolved disappearance, which has given rise to lots of interesting art and speculation. I didn't realize she disappeared for a while and then came back, and to this day, no one knows what happened. What happened? Um, but anyways, yeah, she divorced her first husband and married. And Max Malouin was like a, an archaeologist, who yep. I think discovered Nineveh, right? Like he found the site of Nineveh. Oh, okay. Well, um, and she would go on trips with him. Yeah. And it was actually involved, I believe, in the note. Again, Chris is the expert on this, but she you were she was involved with the, the notation, I think, when they were out on these days. Can you see it in some of the Poirot stories, right? Like he'll go on like Death on the okay. Nile, he goes to Egypt, and oh, okay. like there's a series of novels where he's just going around the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, they just made Death on the Nile into a movie. Um, but uh, And that's based on her own experience as the wife of an archaeologist. I think she had a line about um, girls, you should marry an archaeologist because the older you get, the more interested he is in you. <laughs> Something like that. But, I mean, that's, yeah, that's a nice I, thing, though, but yeah. It's a great line, yeah. But but, I, but that's how it struck me. Is I'm sure that was, you know, for, as a Christian, that was must, must have been interesting to her to be in the Holy Land, but also the synchronicity of archaeology and, uh, and detection, right? You're, yeah. I mean, it's sort of like a big crime scene. Right. Um, and then Sherlock Holmes scholarship, which, you know, Chris and I indulge in, but that was mostly invented by Father Ronald Knox, 
um, who was a great uh, Christian apologist of his own day. I think he said the right. homily, right, at uh, Chesterton's funeral. And he wrote, a, you know, the studies in Sherlock Holmes stories, and it's a critique of biblical scholarship. Right. It's things like, um, you know, oh, Dr. Watson, you know, his he only mentions one wife in the earlier stories, but, uh, you know, she has no family. And then in this one story, it mentions that his wife had a family she had to go visit. So there must have been a second wife or a Deutero Watson who wrote. Yeah, right. Multiple, and, and, and this whole kind of industry, this cottage industry of like Sherlock Holmes scholarship, treating them like they're the canon uh, and trying right, to solve right. these chronological uh, problems in it kind of arose originally as a parody of Bible studies. And I actually kind of wonder if my own interest in theology and scripture studies was incepted by being a kid, being exposed to this sort of stuff. Um, so I just think that's I, that interesting that um, it, it, being a historian, being a biblical scholar and archaeologist, there's kind of the similarity of that to, um, uh, and there's other ones too, like, um, what's his face? Uh, Richard Lancelin Green. Like there was Roger Lancelin Green, who was one of the Inklings, and his son, was a, a big Baker Street irregular, like Sherlock Holmes scholar. Uh, William S. Baringold, who was uh, the first biographer of Sherlock Holmes, was like the grandson of Sabine Baringold, who was the last man who knew everything. He was an Anglican uh, priest who wrote a book on every subject. <laughs> like he, yeah. like a bit, yeah. he, That's what I've heard him called. Like he was almost like a the last of the medievals who just knew, he'd read everything that had ever been written. So right. there's just an interesting, I don't know, overlap between, uh, I guess, uh, mystery geekdom and uh biblical scholarship well, and, and history no. naturally so right because i mean i think it was nt ray who said uh, christianity is profoundly historical and to history it must go uh so for his um for certainly his uh works uh yeah that, that's it right like our, our our theology and history are just ultimately intertwined and you you can't separate it's like the incarnation or right? the hypostatic union or something like this right so mm -hmm. you, you yeah it's it's in our uh our dna right uh, our, our our lifeblood and it's interesting and i and i guess history is sort of intrinsically and this wouldn't even be just history as a discipline like uh, chris belongs to but even i guess historical theology it's it's kind of it's mysteries in a certain sense right it's like this thing happened we're not sure exactly what happened <laughs> Or, or even exactly what Augustine meant when he wrote this. So we've got to go investigate it and kind of construct based on the clues what uh, was really going on. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's all, but there's also reason involved. So in the sense that where there's enough there that we can latch onto, we can grasp, we can firm uh, down uh, as a foundation for for our belief. I'd like to understand, like to stand mm -hmm. under, uh, right? So, uh, but at the end, yes, we're finite. So so we can't mm -hmm. grasp all the mysterion. Of, of of the gospel, uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is um, beyond us. Uh, although within our limitations, uh, temporal and spatial, uh, and, uh, and epistemological, we can still participate, uh, mm -hmm. right, in the great mystery and and have that, uh, I guess, surety uh, <laughs> of faith. I mean, that's the one thing we're we're hoping for. I guess that's the whole point of faith, as 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 long as we're in time. Uh, is we still there's still ground for faith right mm. because if, if all was solved all uh, yeah, where, yeah. where would be the grounds for it right how does hebrews define faith uh, yeah uh thanks, hope, hope for the things, expectation of things uh, hoped for yeah, yeah. The, the evidence of things not seen yes yeah, yeah. um uh, anyway that was just my last so I, I, I guess i'll let just dr chan if you can be your kind of final words but as a historian do you have any thoughts on that as, a, as i said i think i mentioned i forget this was on camera but uh, you also call yourself a detective who only investigates fictional crimes so i guess maybe you've seen uh an alignment between history and detection, but I don't know if you had any comments on that or or anything else. I'll just, we'll just kind of give you the as we come to a close here. I'll just kind of let you have the final uh, the the epilogue. You 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 can be Poirot in the drawing room summarizing everything. <laughs> well, I think yeah, there's so much, and I th think that you know when I I wanted to say that when you I think just an umbrella term the idea that when the critics of the mystery story say that. Do people really need to know what happened? Can't there just be unanswered questions? And I think that, well, what happened, you know, let's take that the other way. What happens when people stop wanting to know why any one thing happens or anything happens? And I think, you know, that can just, I mean, if you don't wonder why something happens or what will happen if you do this, that kills scientific development stone dead. The idea, too, if you don't believe that criminals should be punished, then what? how do you deal with the crime that makes life 
unlivable in some areas. What how do, I mean, do you what happens when you deal with people in power who would abuse their authority? I mean, what do you do with the uh, it happens when you have all these problems? And you talk about the per the microcosm and the macrocosm. How does crime affect people? The idea that the doubts, worrying, you know, what about all these other people, worrying uh, if people what they think of you, because the idea of an unsolved crime, we talk about it can cost someone a relationship, a job, a, a future. And the idea that when people stop wondering anything, like anything from what happened to, in the past or what happens at the end of this book, any book, not just a mystery, or the idea of how can you know what if i did something differently the idea of you know trying to explore something whether it's to create a new invention or whether it's just to see it, what would have you made it did something different artistically or if you tried another experiment in a scientific laboratory and i think you know a whole I, one of the I, the um I'm going to cut if Ed McBain is one of the most popular police um, procedural writers, and I enjoy his work very much, but I have a lot of issues with what he says a lot of it sometimes. Like at, at one point, he, in almost every book, he has his detectives say that, you know, Corella hated mysteries. He knew that in real life, there are no mysteries, only crimes and the people who commit them. And I can only assume that McBain heard that from a real life policeman while he was doing his research before his first book and liked it so much he repeated over and over again. <laughs> and I basically, whenever I read that, I become um, the um, Frank Costanza meme uh, that you see online, where you have him say, basically, Jerry Stiller is Frank Costanza saying, What? Does that even mean? Mm -hmm. And the idea there are no mysteries. It's like there are no mysteries, only crimes. And I, I say, so wait a minute. So D D Corella, there's been a, cr a crime, right? Yes. And you don't know who did it, right? Yes. And you're trying to figure out who did it, right? Yes. And you're not going to stop until you figure out who did it, right? Yes. That's a mystery. Um, and it's like every, it's, once again, every time he says, there are, in real life, there are no mysteries. I, so all of a sudden, I turn into Mandy Patinkin, the Princess Bride. And I keep saying, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> So, and there's mysteries everywhere. And we talk about the, um, Lynch and the idea some mysteries have to do with the nature of existence or, you know, who, what's going to happen. Like a, a mystery in history can be so that what happened, what a person was really like. Or, yeah, but it's can, just the fact is when you talk about mystery about something you don't know and want to find out, I mean, it, 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 you know how, how it is really I would I counter to Ed McBain in real life there's almost nothing but mysteries and a whole lot of lo lo uh, life is trying to investigate them hmm. that, that's an interesting um, uh, I guess a motto for education <laughs> in some ways it's kind of a, a or what would you call that like a uh, a charter for education. A charter, a charter sure. for education. Yeah. yeah. Well, I um, I'm, I have more to say, of course, but I'll, I'll I'll table. Is there anything you wanted to add or ask as well before we conclude? Then. No, I just want to thank Dr. Chen for joining us today. Is is marvelous to be able to to meet you and to chat and have this whole new. Uh, you know, discussion or at least thoughts on on yeah. mystery and uh, detective uh, genre yeah, and chewing on some candy. of it for sure. Yes, in yeah. the future, maybe in the future we could do one laser focused on like Father Brown or something, or yeah, yeah. have you back to discuss something or, or yeah. other other reviews that'd be fun. But yeah. Doctor McLaren, you want to close us in prayer? Sure. Yeah. Well, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give great thanks and praise 
uh, for giving us the breath of life, for allowing us to walk upon this good earth. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for giving us a hope of, of things unseen uh, and the certitude of knowing uh, the truth, the way, the life in this world. Uh, we pray that you continue to uh, bless and guide our, our thoughts, our words in this life. And uh, we thank you for those uh, creative writers who have been able to bequeath uh, to us a, a, a treasure of, of literature that uh, stimulates uh, uh, our minds and uh, allows our hearts to consider uh, the human condition. Uh, we pray that uh, we may uh, use these uh, to our enlightenment and to your greater glory. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Spirit. Amen. Thanks again, Dr. Chan. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate, appreciate it. I'm glad we're finally able to schedule this. So thank you both once again. Thank you. God bless, man. Thank you very much.